through our study through the book of Genesis to this point, we have studied the account of God's amazing creation. We have studied the fall into sin of Adam and Eve and their expulsion from the garden. We also have studied the, the birth of their two sons, Cain and Abel, the first murder of humanity as Cain takes the life of his brother Abel. And also we have studied God's judgment, God's curse upon Cain because he spilled his brother's blood on the ground. Now, if you remember this scripture, these two sons of Adam and Eve have differing professions. Abel is a shepherd and Cain is a farmer. However, these are both very acceptable pro professions before God. However, after the murder of his brother, God curses Cain so that he could never farm again. It's interesting, let me remind you that when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God said to Adam, you're going to be able to produce fruit from the ground, but it's gonna take sweat from your brow now. You're gonna to have to labor for it. However, when God curses Cain for the murder of his brother, he said, the ground will never bear to you again. And so God took away Cain's profession of gardening, of being a farmer. He would never farm again. He would be a fugitive and an aimless wanderer in this world called a vagabond for the rest of his earthly life. Now, although Cain is a convicted murderer, I think this is very interesting. God puts a mark on him. And this mark is a mark of protection because Cain was worried that when he wandered in this world that someone would in turn murder him. And so God puts a mark on Cain it's a mark of protection that no one would touch him, but also at the same time, God's mark is a mark of rejection, that he had marked Cain for life because he was a murderer. So isn't it interesting that that mark on Cain served as protection and rejection from God Almighty. There's a sermon there. Maybe one of these days I will delve into that a little more deeply. But we enter now into scripture that we seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. You know, whenever you are here at Clifford Baptist Church and you hear the Word of God proclaimed. It is the Holy Spirit of God that sits down by your side and teaches you and me as we hear His Word. Whenever you open your Bible in your home, in your prayer closet, it is the Holy Spirit that draws up close to you and teaches you and instructs you from His Word. When you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit beside you, within you, is teaching you His Word. We need His presence with us today. I need His presence beside me as I teach this scripture this day. We ask for His blessing. I believe in God's holy and divine wisdom that He gives us indication in Scripture that we're not going to figure all this out by ourselves. But if we're going to learn eternal truths from His Word, we have to depend on Him to be our teacher because we are not going to be wise enough in our humanity to be, to be able to interpolate what God is saying and interpret what God is saying in His Word. And so as we look today, our prayer together is Holy Spirit come and teach us in these moments. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Some of the most challenging words, this is the question that arises over and over again about Cain in his life. Listen to these words, Genesis 4, 16. After God curses Cain as a murderer, it says, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. Let's stop there for the moment. Keep your Bible open. We're not done with Scripture yet. But after God issues his curse upon Cain as a murderer, he tells Cain that he's going to be a wanderer and a fugitive and a vagabond for the rest of his earthly life. Scripture tells us that Cain departs out of Eden and he goes to the land of Nod, traveling eastward. Now, the Hebrew word Nod simply means wandering. He goes to a land in which he is going to wander for the rest of his life. Now, just as we do not know the exact location of Eden, we certainly don't know the exact location of the land of Nod, but geographically, it is somewhere in the Middle East. 
We know that much. Now, here comes the gap where we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. S scripture simply says, Cain and his wife have children. Well, now, if Cain is the first child of the first human couple on this world, where did his wife come from? You've asked me that question many, many times in these weeks. Where did she come from? Did she come from Eden? Did he meet her in the land of Nod? Where did she come from? Well, Scripture tells us, of course, that Cain was Adam and Eve's first son. And Adam most likely was a young man when their first child was born to Adam and to Eve. Now, you'll also notice in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, that Adam lived 800 years after his third son, Seth, was born. And it also tells us that he had sons and daughters in those years. So, it is absolutely essential that we understand that Cain married a younger sister. In the beginning of humanity, the gene pool was so undiluted, so pure, that marrying a sister in these days was not incest. God permitted it, God ordained it so that humanity could grow, so humanity could fill the earth. It was God's plan to begin and to grow humanity. Now, by Moses' time, this intermarriage within the family was denied by God. In Leviticus chapter 18, it says that marriage within families is now forbidden. But at the beginning of humanity, Cain could marry his sister, and it was totally fine for him to do so, ordained by God. Now, I've checked commentators and commentaries all over the place, and they do agree on this one point. In fact, there's one commentary in my office. It's an English commentary called the pulpit commentary, and I love to go to it. It is very precise. But this is what the pulpit commentary says about Cain marrying a wife. He says this. Cain's wife must have been his sister whom Cain married before the death of Abel. After that event, can it be scarcely supposed that any woman would want to connect herself with such a miserable fratricide? In other words, would any woman in her right mind marry a man who killed his own brother? So pulpit commentary says that he was married before he killed Abel. Well, that's all conjecture. We have no idea. Scripture does not uh, speak to it whatsoever. Those are some of those questions that we're going to have to ask when we get through those golden gates of heaven. But we do know that in Scripture it says that Cain married, and it was an acceptable union before God. So Cain and his wife, living in Nod, under the curse of God still, in this very unfavorable state, God still blesses them. He blesses Cain and his wife with a son, and they named their son Enoch. Now remember, Cain can no longer farm. God said, the, the ground will never yield to you again. You have lost your profession of farming. So Cain goes into a new profession. He becomes a builder. I want you to look. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that Cain builds a city, and he names it after his son. His son's name is Enoch, and that's what he names the city. Now, Enoch, the son, grows up. Enoch marries as well. By this time, the children of Adam and Eve have uh, had children of their own, so most likely Enoch marries a cousin. Marriages now are growing. The people are getting married all over Adam and Eve's expanding family. Enoch becomes the father of a son whose name is Irad. Irad marries, and the lineage of Cain grows, multiplies, and it tells us in Scripture that Irad has a son, Mahujael. Mahujael has a son, Methusael. And Methusael has a son whose name is Lamech. Now, the story comes down to Lamech. I want you to concentrate on Lamech. Lamech is the great, great, great grandson of Cain. That means he is the great, 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 great grandson of Adam. Moses, then, the writer of Genesis, is establishing the fact that this bloodline of Cain continues to grow. The lineage is growing. The generations are coming. The curse of God is still upon Cain and upon his family. As the family grows, the curse is passed along. Cain's generations and lineage is now well established. Everybody with me? So we're looking on down the line to great, great, great grandson whose name is Lamech. Now with that story, let's focus on Lamech, that grandson of Cain. Genesis 4, 19 through 24. Hear God's word. 
And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech, remember this story is about him primarily. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. Keep your Bible open, but let's stop right there for the moment. As I finish reading this section, I hope that you're picking up by the Holy Spirit's guidance in Scripture that Lamech's life continues this downward spiral of sin that was established by his great-great-great-grandfather, Cain. He's carrying on a very sinful lifestyle. It's passed on through the family. According to Genesis chapter 4, verse 19, Lamech is the first bigamist in the world. You know, God, in his original blessing on marriage, says that, that, a, that a man and a woman are going to cling together. They're going to be one body, one flesh, a man and a wife. And Lamech steps out and marries two wives. I don't know why he'd do that. One's a plenty. <laughs> I, see, I see some head nods back there. <laughs> but through two wives... Lamech has three sons. Again, Jabal, who kept livestock. Jubal, who made and played musical instruments. And then a son named Tubal Cain, who worked in metal. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us differently, so I am supposing that all of this family lived in that city of Enoch, that city that Cain established and named it after his son. All of them were making a society right there in that one city of Enoch, but society, I want you to see, is growing, it is developing, it is diversifying. You'll notice there's food there, there's metal work there, there's music there. One of these sons even makes and plays musical instruments. So society is growing and burgeoning and changing. However, there's one thing missing. God. God is not mentioned as being a part of this growing society. There was food and metalwork and music, but God's never mentioned. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 23, Lamech admits that he's murdered a man. He's carrying on his great-great-great-grandfather's tradition. He, too, is a murderer. Now, you also notice uh, in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, that as a murderer, Lamech said, well, God protected my great-great-great-granddaddy seven times over, so that means he'll protect me 77 times over. He called on protection, but he never acknowledges God as his God. So let me, let me now stop here and sum up all of this section of Scripture. I want you to stay on board with me and follow along in what God is saying to us. This society that's growing never mentions the name of God has some great things happening. People are getting connected. Beauty is happening. People are buying metalwork and setting it in their homes. And people are learning to play musical instruments and things are happening in a good way. There's industry that's happening here in this city. However, God is never mentioned. This is a godless society. God is never worshiped. God is never mentioned. Cain's continuing lineage is a lost, godless, wicked people. Generation after generation after generation is coming, and they're still murderers, and they're bigamists, and they're sinners, and they never mention the name of God, never asking for forgiveness. They formed an ingenious working society, but at the end of it all, they died and they went to hell because they were godless. Now let's talk about another lineage before we close God's word today. A lineage that gets established through God's hand. Look at Genesis 4. 
Go to verse 25. Now remember, we've talked about Cain's lineage. Now we're going to talk about another brother that establishes a lineage. 425, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Look at this last sentence now, the last sentence of chapter 4. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So Moses takes us back to Adam and Eve. After Abel dies at the hand of his brother Cain, Adam and Eve are given another son, a third son. His name is Seth. And Seth reestablishes this godly lineage that Abel had begun to establish. Seth takes up where Abel leaves off. Seth grew up. He has a son named Enos. And I want you to look at that last line again, verse 26. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So here is a lineage of godly people. So you see Cain's lineage, and as it unfolds, it continues to be ungodly and wicked and unforgiven and never calling on the name of God. So here's Cain. Then he has a brother, Seth. Seth begins a lineage, and it says, with the beginning of that lineage, they call on the name of God. An ungodly lineage and a godly lineage. I want you to see the difference of those two. Well, what we study today is this. Moses has described those two lineages out of Adam and Eve. These generations flow from two brothers, Cain and Seth. Cain has a godless family. Seth establishes a godly family. Now, before I close today, I want you to look at a couple more verses with me. We're going to skip ahead. We'll get back to these verses later on down the line, but I want you to go to Genesis chapter 6. First two verses, Genesis chapter 6. Again, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance here. There's a lot of conjecture about what these verses mean. We will study this again, but today these verses say, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives of all which they chose. If you continue to read in chapter 6, you will find that this establishes, again, some very lost people. There's a lot of dispute about those verses, and we'll study them again, but here's what I believe. The sons of God were Seth's lineage. Daughters of men were Cain's lineage. And these sons and daughters intermarry. Godly young people marrying ungodly young people. Seth's line and Cain's line get mixed together. And except for eight people, one of those eight is Noah. We'll talk about that later on down the line. But except for eight people, the world walks away from God. The world pushes God to the side, totally rebellious against the Lord. How do I know that? Because in just a little bit of time, God's going to wipe them all away in a great flood. The world walks away from him except for eight people. Seth's godly lineage gets mixed up with the ungodly, and the world won. They pushed God to the side. They cast their Lord to the side, and the result was a flood that washed them all away. Well, how do I end this sermon today? I don't want us to forget this. Listen, we still live in such a world. These words are thousands of years old, but we still live in that same kind of world. Believers, this is what I want to say to you as we sum up what the Bible is teaching us today. Never, never, never compromise your faith. Never compromise your belief in how you live this perfect word in a world that wants to take us away from it. Always guard your mind. Always guard your heart so that you are following the will and the word of God Almighty. To this very day, I believe that there are many people who have placed their faith and their trust and their hope in Jesus Christ as Savior, but they're living a life of compromise. And the word never gets opened. 
and they never come to church, never worship the Lord, and lives become filled with compromise. Though that person knows Jesus in a personal relationship, he keeps getting pushed to the side because there are more important things to do than open the Word and come to church. Church is not important. Outside interests get so much attention that things of the Lord are pushed aside. And here's what happens. When believers, like Seth's lineage, start compromising with the world, when true believers start compromising with the world, God starts to get pushed aside, and the worldly things start to take root in that life. And as the lineage goes on down the line, children know less and less and less about the name and the word and the love of God. The next generation, ladies and gentlemen, is, important, is, is depending on what we do as the people of God and how we will live without compromise our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, believing parents can get so busy in the world that the Bible never gets open, church never, come, never is important. We cannot let that happen. In this church, it shouldn't happen in any church in this world. People of God, we need to stay true to our Savior. We need to stay, stay true in what this Word says to us. We need to maintain what is true priorities in our life. As Pastor Jeffrey preached some time ago, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the priorities of your life and your belief and faith in Jesus Christ to be the priorities of your life, and don't let the world get a foothold in your family. That's what happened here. And all of them fell away except for eight. We have to stay true. The world took over Cain and Seth's generations. And we know it's true because they all were washed away in a flood. And we have to live in this world, ladies and gentlemen, but we do not have to live of this world. We are to stand up and be counted for the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, here's the summation. How many of us will approach the altar of our heart and perhaps even the physical altar of this church and say, Lord, keep me true? I want to keep you as my priority. As parents and grandparents, will we say, Lord God, however young my children are, however old my children are, however many grandchildren I have, I want to be a mentor and a guide that I set the footsteps that my family will continue to be a godly generation. The decision that you and I make today establishes a great deal about what will happen to our church tomorrow. What we teach these little ones as they come to church and what they see in us will largely be lived out tomorrow. So my question is, what are we doing to plant Jesus in the next generation that sits at our supper table and sits here in this church and sees us out in the world as school teachers and mentors in their lives? What does that generation see? How do we maintain a godliness as the lineage goes on? A lot of that depends on the decision that you and I make today, adults. How many of us will approach the, th the altar of our heart and say, God, give me the strength, give me the wisdom to stay true to you so that those who follow me will be able to follow in godly footsteps? The failure in Genesis 4 is God was pushed aside. What will we do? What will you do? What will I do? Today's the day to nail that down with the Lord. If tomorrow's generation is going to be godly, it takes our commitment today to be godly. Amen? What decision will you make for Jesus today? And before we close God's Word, if you've never come to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today, make that huge choice in your life. It will change everything about your life for the good. It will give you purpose. You can lay your head on a pillow tonight and know that all the guilt of all the sin that you've ever done or will do is forgiven. It will give you a reason to get up tomorrow morning because you're going to live for the king and it's going to assure you of a home in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is absolutely clear cut. There is no coloring this. There's no whitewashing it. There is no sweetening it. When any person dies, there are only two places they can go. Heaven or hell.
The Bible teaches us that God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And he has provided the one way for every one of us to know him and have a heavenly home, and that is through his son Jesus. One way. He is the way and the truth and the life. No man will come to the Father but by him. If today you've never come to him, I want you to know, and again, this is the Holy Spirit tapping you on the shoulders and showing you right here, Jesus is standing here with his arms wide open waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He died for you. He has risen again for you. And right here today, publicly, he's waiting for your decision to say yes to him. Today is that day. This is your invitation. This is your moment. We'll wait till you make that decision. Church home, whatever the need. Praise God, he meets us here. Let's pray. Our Father. I come before you today, Lord, to say this is tough scripture. And I pray, Lord, that you have taken control of my tongue and my thoughts and that you have communicated, as Pastor Clyde prayed today, the message that you wanted us to hear, including me. When we look at these generations, Lord, coming from Adam and Eve, we see a godly lineage and an ungodly lineage, but they get so mixed up that all of them leave God. And eventually they're washed away in a flood. For our families, for our church, for those people we know in our lives, the next generation and their decisions of faith and following you depends on what this generation does and the decisions that we make to be godly and holy and people without compromise in our life. I pray, Lord, not just for my brothers and sisters as believers here. I pray for myself today that every one of us as believers will make that decision to keep you as a priority of our life and not let anything else from this world sway us from that priority. May we live your word so others see Jesus in us. And Father, for that one person who needs Jesus as Savior, I pray that this is their moment of decision. Whatever healing is needed here, Father, you are more than able to meet us. Bless us in this very important moment, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.